Welcome to ACT TV. I'm Juliana Forlano. San Francisco, New York City, Shanghai. Climate change will alter all of these centers of civilization and culture beyond recognition over the coming decades, and I would argue possibly even sooner. As human activity remakes the climate, strengthening storms, rising sea levels are inevitable, and no one really is prepared to meet the magnitude of these challenges to come. Coastal communities will be particularly hard hit and locales as far flung as Eel, Japan, London, England, and all the ones I just mentioned will struggle to adapt to the increasing trauma and fever in our ocean system. In the Atlas of Disappearing Places, a new book um, subtitled Our Coasts and Oceans in the Climate Crisis, co-author and artist Christina Conklin makes a plea in the way that only an artist can to save the health of our oceans, on which we all depend, using an a beautiful, moving, innovative ink on dried seaweed technique. Conklin has created maps depicting 20 locations across the globe that are in danger of disappearing if we don't change course. Christina Conklin is joining us today to speak about the book and about her work in addition to climate change. Christina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, well, where do we start? Uh, you know, so many people are really afraid right now. I think across the globe, we are seeing there is no area that has been untouched. At first, when we were talking about sea level rise and climate change, we were concerned about the Maldives and the Philippines, and now it's every single place and touching people in their lives. I have friends, should I fly to Greece and go visit my mother I haven't seen in two years, but Greece is on fire, you know, et cetera. People are really afraid for their futures for in the per, in the present moment and for th you know the loss of things we love like trees and nature and and animals um a lot of talk is always about climate change is about ourselves but the the enormous loss of the beloved things that that you know that people love is is another area in so it seems like we're not allowed to talk about those things and art as you have shown has this singular capacity by bypassing the words. Can you talk about the ways art and artists can help people get through the fear that they are experiencing right now and maybe even inspire some action? Well, I think art has the, this ability to touch people. <clears throat> and, um, excuse me, <clears throat> um, I wanted to um, make the point that we're not actually separate from nature. We are actually, you know, we're one species of millions. We're part of nature. We've done a lot of things to make ourselves um, separate from nature, uh, especially in recent decades with kind of the extractive um, economy with uh, cons consumerism. But uh, I think in making the art, I really wanted to show how deeply related we are to the ocean and how, I mean, we come from the sea, if you think evolutionarily, which I like to do, um, you know, this is, this is really fundamental to who we are as as beings and we uh, really need to get back in touch with that relationship with the natural world. Um, if we don't, we're, we're wrecking our only home. How do you think people can do that? It seems well, like there's so much pushing us against that. Right. I, I, I think we got to push back, right? I, I, I think it, it in, in a lot of ways, it boils down to individual choices. We, we need to um, make the concerted uh, effort to, to have a relationship with, with the natural world, to really read and think and learn about the natural world in a way that makes us feel that connection. And, um, you know, instead of going to the mall, uh, go, on, go on a walk, right? It, it, we it can't go to the mall now because we'll get COVID. <laughs> At least something positive is gonna come out of this. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, and, the, and of course, COVID showed how connected all these systems are. I mean, it is just we are part of one system. And, and so we can imagine that these things are separate, but every choice we make has an impact. And that's, you know, really what I think I learned from the book was, um, was how, how deeply intertwined every aspect of the ocean system is with weather, with, um, uh, you know, the, the the fires in Greece, the 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 floods that are happening all over the world. These things are all, and, and this is really the thin end of the wedge. So if we're feeling yeah. that there's some pressure on us right now, we are at the very very beginning of dramatic changes 
um, some of which are going to unfold regardless of what we do. But of course, we can we have a lot of power to impact the the rate of change and the enormity of the um, the disasters to come. Because um, in, unless we start to we you know stop using fossil fuels. Um, and draw back down uh, carbon emissions to a pre-industrial level, um, then, you know, we're really, it's going to be a very, very difficult transition um, through the next few decades. One of the things I really liked about the book, and yeah, we cover climate change on this show quite a bit, and um, it's a lot of numbers. It's a lot of, it's going to go up by 20 feet. It's a lot of graphs. <laughs> you know, and I loved the book because you gave f fictional images of what our most endangered areas may look like by 2050, which isn't that far away. Most people watching will be alive and their kids will be trying to, and their kids will be, you know, uh, I think that is, uh, what what drove you to do that? I think it's incredibly useful. In, in, in fact, when I ask people, I'm like, well, what does that exactly mean to people? They'll say climate migration. But what does that exactly, it means you have to pack up your house. Oh, you can't pack up your house. You just take your clothes on your back and you walk to, I don't know, Canada, because one of your maps shows how everyone's going to be moving north. I just, can you talk about that that speculative aspect of your work? Right. Well, what drove me to write the book in the first place was an article in my local paper where somebody said something like they didn't care what was going to happen in 30 years because, you know, they'd be dead or something. And I thought that was just out outraged me. And I thought, OK, oh, 30 years, people, 30 years is the blink of an eye. My children need that world to be healthy. And so um, so in each chapter of the book, we write a story uh, of, of what, um, what that place could look like in 30 years. And that, that's a combination of, you know, the disasters that will come if we don't, if we keep going with business as usual, and also the hopeful possibilities of what can change. So, so we, it's a way of introducing a lot of the wonderful things that are already happening in the world to change the story, to write a new story. So it's everything from like innovative ways to cultivate seaweed as a as a biofuel to um, policy changes and changes in law that could really change the direction of um, of the whole of the whole planet and and also individual actions um, you know let's stop buying plastic right if we don't buy it they won't make it and I do, um, I I think they will make it. They'll force it down our throats. <laughs> well, right now we need to know though that the, 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 the fossil fuel industry plans to replace every drop of, of um, gas we don't use in our cars with plastic that we do use, disposable plastic items. So that is their, you know, that is their business plan. And, um, and so if we Not know- Not recycled about, ones, right? New ones, some new right. kind of one. Yeah, and, and all of and all plastics are just another f fossil fuel. And and so they, you know, the prediction is that there will be as a pound of plastic in the ocean for every pound of fish by the year 2050, unless we do something very different. So yeah. it's it's time to uh, really have an awakening, I feel culturally that that we're we're on the wrong track and that we can change that track because we we have the power to do so. I don't want to make people think that this book is giantly depressing. It's actually very heartening. There's um, stories and views of positive change that are happening, which are really wonderful. But um, we're seeing today, the reports are out today, just in time for your interview, which I don't know. We had to reschedule this interview several times. So maybe it's kismet that, it, that it, you happen to be here today. The reports that the um, the flow in the Atlantic, that I think it's called a belt, is breaking down uh, meaning that all of the weather is going to be changing abruptly, which it's already doing. I don't understand how people don't see this, but it's already doing this. Um, that is that that is the flow that keeps Europe habitable. Without it, as it continues to break down, uh, Europe will not be habitable. What are your thoughts? About, did you see this in the news? Yes, right. So, and we talk about this in the book. It's the uh, yes, the ocean conveyor belt in the Atlantic Ocean. Conveyor belt. I knew it was some yeah. kind of belt. Yeah, it's like the airport. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, right, so it brings the warm air up from the tropics and it makes Northern Europe and, and Eastern North America, um, you know, far, far warmer and more comfortable and, and, you know, able to grow crops than, than, uh, than it would be otherwise. 
Um, there was there was a past example of this this current slowing down um, about 500 years ago, and it and it led to what's called the Little Ice Age in Europe. Um, and and so you know these these things have real impacts um, on this the global scale. You were talking earlier about uh, climate migration. Uh, you know the UN expects hundreds of millions of climate migrants to. Um, have to take to the road in the coming decades because their lands are no longer habitable. I write about uh, Vietnam where in the Mekong Delta they grow half of the rice for the country of Vietnam on a very small piece of, uh, of the land, but the land is all three feet or, or less above sea level and it's expected to basically disappear by you know, in the next 30, 40, 50 years. I think it's less than that. I think we're going to be, personally, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but I am married to a scientist. But <laughs> yeah, I, I really think, I mean, just looking outside where I live, which is in the Northeast, we've had a very wet, floody, overly rainy and cold summer. And when I go to just like casually pick blueberries at the blueberry farm, there aren't any. So I'm not sure when we're going to be seeing this effect hit our, um, our grocery stores and our tables, but I would imagine it's going to be within the next year or two. This can't, it's not going to be, I'm just saying, right. I'm going against science. I'm putting my money on. We're in trouble right now, which maybe if we could get to that guy who wrote, I don't care what's going to happen in 30 years because he's so self-centered. If we suggest to him, I'm assuming it's a guy, <laughs> sorry, would he, to say, yep. <laughs> uh, you know, it's going to be you and it's going to be now. I mean, we are seeing it right. now. Well, and it's already hundreds of millions of people all over the world. So we're fairly protected in our comfortable, you know, economy and environment um, for the most part. But uh, there's real suffering happening all over the world. And the other thing that I really wanted to point out in this book is that, you know, we're one species, as you, as, uh, as you noted, that, that there are billions of creatures in the, in the ocean who are part of a food web, part of a living system, um, part of the earth system. And we are unfolding changes for these creatures. I mean, you're showing a polar bear, but there are also these microorganisms that are the basis of the entire food web. <clears throat> the, un the changes that are unfurling in the open ocean are dramatic. The ocean is 26% more acidic uh, than it was 50 years ago. I mean, imagine living in, a, in an environment that is you know, that much more acidic um, and it's losing oxygen so warmer water is less, less able to contain oxygen. So imagine that you are a creature living in an environment that doesn't have enough oxygen. So it, you know, and, and we don't understand enough about the ocean and how the, um, this very complicated web of life actually operates. Um, I wrote one chapter about the Arabian Sea, which used to be based on one system of uh, phytoplankton and um, in the food web. And then it just flipped in a, in a few years to an ent entirely other system. It was called regime shift. And these things will be happening more and more around the world with, you know, just really unknown impacts. So the only thing we can do is stop using fossil fuels and draw down carbon emissions. That's the only way to write a new story. Let's take a look at some of the beautiful artwork that you have in your in your book, The Atlas of Disappearing Places. And if you could just talk about the art, one of one of the images that I loved so much was um, I don't know if they have names, but it's it's um, the one where you use the dots on the uh, coastlines to show how many people live in the. There it is. <laughs> how many people live? Oh wait, I think there's a different one with its where it's just dots. Well, we could talk about this one too, because that's interesting, but we'll get the dots one up there. And it's just, there it is. It shows- um, So those are all the yeah, cities in the that. world yeah. that, that are gonna be affected by climate change. Those are the cities that will be affected by, by sea level rise. <clears throat> so that's everywhere, right? Can you see any part of the world that isn't outlined there? Except for, you know, Northern Australia and Northern Canada. Um, that's really everywhere. And so I just really, every chapter I wanted to include maps that show, that tell both a specific story about a specific place, this is in the New York chapter, um, but that also show the global reach of, of the problem because um, each one of these problems affects everywhere on earth. And, and you think like, oh, well, if it's flooded, we'll just move inland. No, there's no, there's no. <laughs> inland is on fire, I'm sorry. It's not just <laughs> rising, you know, rising 
And it, well, in a way, I would, what I would say is actually that uh, sea level rise is one of the easier problems for us to solve because we can move. Like there, we do have you know the capability, and 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 some countries have have the resources if they plan early enough to make these moves. And the story in New York is is that really people just need to move to higher ground. Um, the 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 urban planners and the city officials and the voting public need to understand that you cannot defend 520 miles of shoreline with seawalls in a, in, a, in a world where the ocean is going to rise for the next 500 years. Mm. So um, the last time we had this much carbon in our atmosphere, seas were 50 to 80 feet higher. Mm. Um, our job is to turn that story around and, and tell a new story. Mm. And you're doing that right here with art. Can you talk about this image that we're looking at on the screen right now? So this is New York City. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the social vulnerability map of New York City. So all of the painted areas are the uh, You think about the economic devastation um, and the social, you know, the, the social devastation that that will cause again and again and again, the only solution is for people to invest in, uh, in, in, in change and, and in redevelopment of, uh, of land on higher ground to build smart cities. There's, there's wonderful planning, uh, uh, you know, options out there that, um, that urban planners really would like to enact. Uh, I, I, I feature a, um, the climate czar in New York City uh, in this chapter. And, and you know, I think he really would love to move further faster, but you're constrained by what the public will, will allow. So I think part of my call is that people understand this change is coming and that we have to adapt and we have to be smart and invest early uh, and not, not pretend that, that this is um, just going to magically not happen. I'm from the things that we cover here at Act TV and from what we've seen over the course of the, well, the last five decades, but also the last year with the pand year and a half with the pandemic, it doesn't seem like the people with the cash really care about what's happening to the people who are going to be more specifically affected. Some of those areas in New York are probably the lower income areas down along the base of New York, uh, around Brooklyn. Some of those areas in New Jersey are actually, that you showed in New Jersey, are actually more well healed. But it, it, it seems to me, when I speak to people, they are not aware that this is coming right away, even though it is happening you know, right now. We had a huge flood right here not too long ago. It, I'm not sure what part of that you might want to speak to. The, the, the fact that the people who can make that urban plan don't care about the people who might be affected and the ones with money can move. It is. It's a real, I, I think it's incumbent upon us all. I mean, I think to really understand the vulnerability of large numbers of people, the vulnerable people often do live at the shoreline. So all of the red areas shows the most vulnerable people. And and it's really just a moral call of our time to take care of, of all the people. And, uh, you know, I guess I, it's hard to know how to say it beyond, beyond that, that it's, you know, we really need to change our values and have our values drive our decisions. Um, this, is the, this, this is a real, um, we're, we're at a crossroads culturally uh, because the climate crisis has really put this right in front of our, our faces that, that our, our ways of, um, making decisions and doing politics of, of recent decades is, is really, really broken and is going to cause really untold amounts of suffering. Uh, we are speaking with Christina Conklin, author of The Atlas of Disappearing Places, combining art and science, a groundbreaking new book that brings to life the coastal communities dying from climate change. Christina, what are your hopes for the book as it makes its way out into the public? Well, my hope is that it sparks a lot of understanding about the ocean because I, I love the ocean. I think a lot of people do. I really want people to understand the complexity and beauty of that system and how related to it we are, um, that it's not separate. It's not over there, some big, cold, empty bathtub. It's a, it's, it is the basis of the living world that we, 
that we live on. And, um, and there's, you know, there's no other book on the ocean in this, in, in this same way. So that, that I would like people to learn a lot and, um, and really understand that we can each be part of this change, that we must all figure out what our, what our best uh, offering is and make it. Um, this, it. Now is the time, this is the decade. This is, uh, we call it the all hands on deck decade. Um, decade. This, this is when <laughs> the change needs to happen uh, according to scientists and the UN, this is when major policy changes need to happen and we really need to press our politicians and, 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 and make some bold changes in our own lives as well. Well, that's what we're doing here on ACT Now, helping to press our politicians, helping to raise the voices of the people who are fighting for justice, both on the climate and in every other area. Christina, thank you so much for following us, or excuse me, for joining us. The book is the top, the Atlas of Disappearing Places on sale now. I encourage everyone to go get one. Thanks again, Christina. Thanks so much for having me. You're watching ACT TV. Don't forget to follow us across platforms. This is our brand new show, ACT Now. I am looking very, very much forward to having you back uh, next week. I'm Juliana Forlano. You can follow me on Twitter at Juliana Forlano. Uh, and you can follow ACT TV across platforms. We're on the Insta. We're on the Facebooks. We're on the YouTube. And if you miss any of these shows live, you can watch uh, the replay on YouTube in, in the following days. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.